The Mahasita Naropa, the Dauntless. Like the hosts of the Universal Emperor, conquering the continents and islands. The yogin who knows the taste of sahaja, conquers samsara, and pure pleasure reigns. Naropa was the offspring of a mixed caste union. His father was a dealer in liquor in Pataliputra in the east of India. But Naropa did not follow his father in the liquor business. He became a wood gatherer, selling his wood in the marketplace. He was not happy with this mode of life, and when he heard tell of the great sage Tilopa, he decided to leave Pataliputra in search of him. He traded a load of wood for a deerskin and set out for Vishnunagar, to all appearances a yogin. At Vishnunagar, he was informed that Tilopa had recently left that city. Undaunted, Naropa began a search for his guru that was to last many years. He wandered the length and breadth of India, asking everywhere for news of Tilopa. Finally, by pure coincidence, he met him on the road. Prostrating in the dust and circumambulating him, he addressed him as Guru, inquiring after his health. I am not your Guru and you are not my disciple, Tilopa stormed at him, and then he struck him angrily. Naropa's faith was unshaken. He went to beg food and brought it back for Tilopa. Tilopa ate it and then beat him again in anger. Naropa's faith grew. Ignoring Tilopa's obvious displeasure, he ate his guru's trifling leftovers and circumambulated him again. He remained with him, begging him for food, in a, begging food for him in the day and sleeping close by him at night. Twelve years passed in this way, Naropa serving his guru without complaint, although he never received a kind word. One day, Naropa begged his food at a wedding feast. The host was most generous, giving the mendicant yogin 84 different types of curry, amongst which was a rare delicacy. He carried them back to Tilopa, who was delighted with the delicacy. Where did you find this, my son? he asked. Please bring some more. Naropa was as happy as a bodhisattva on the first level of the path. I have sat at my guru's feet for twelve years without so much as a who are you, he thought to himself, and today he calls me his son. He was ecstatic. He returned to the wedding feast four more times to satisfy his guru's desire for the delicacy, and each time it was giving ungrudgingly. But returning a fifth time, he thought, I am ashamed to beg for the same curry again, yet if I do not, I will incur my guru's displeasure. I will steal it. So when the wedding guests were preoccupied, he stole a pot of the curry and walked off with it. Tilopa was delighted with his disciple's perseverance, calling him my diligent son. He then bestowed the initiation and blessing of Vajra Varahi upon him and instructed him in meditation. It took Naropa six months of practice to gain Mahamudra Sibi. Thereafter, he became known throughout the world, and devotees came to worship him from the four quarters of the earth. The light that emanated from his body could be seen at a distance of one month's journey from his hermitage. After working tirelessly for countless disciples, he rose bodily into the Dakini's paradise. Sadhana This synopsis of Naropa's famous story hardly does the guru justice. It is not that he is characterized as a mixed-race caste son of a liquor dealer, a wood-gatherer himself, and a man of little intellect rather than the scion of a royal Bengali Brahmin family of staggering intellectual brilliance, abbot of Nalanda. It is that after having stolen the curry at the wedding feast, the narrator allows him to walk off with it and receive Tilopa's praise, rather than to be pursued by the irate guests, roasted in an iron box, and beat into an inch of his life. Quote unquote, thrashed like rice and like sesame seed crushed, moaned Naropa, this twisted copper kettle of samsara deserves to be smashed, replied his guru. In the wonderful biography of Naropa, available in English, the seemingly well-balanced, wise, and successful abbot of Nalanda comes to a midlife crisis, caused perhaps by the schizoid stress of continuous absorption in the mere academic theory of non-dual philosophy, wherein simple sensual perception is elevated to divine enjoyment and a state of beatitude is reached through cessation of metaphysical objectification and logical discursiveness. Whatever the cause, a Dakini's messenger, Tilopa's sister, appears to him in the guise of an old hag and tells him that he knows not the meaning of what he reads, and that he must find his guru. On the road, eleven more visions, mostly of a repulsive nature, gradually undermine Naropa's conventional prejudices and humanistic values such as honesty, humanity, and, pur and purity. 
His guru is the embodiment of a mind quite free of conceptualizing and conflicting thought. And Naropa can uh, encounter him only when is as Tilopa uh, when he is as Tilopa is. Even after their meeting, before he can obtain teaching, he must suffer twelve further acts of self-denial. Twelve acts like the story of his begging at the wedding party, with the death of Naropa's ego indicated at its conclusion, either by the final moral indignity of theft or by physical beating to the point of death. Destruction of belief in an I is the aim of Naropa's ascetic acts. For instance, in order to obtain instruction in eternal delight, Naropa is ordered to find a girl who he proceeds to live with for some time in health and fidelity, happiness and love. Later they drift apart and Naropa is left demeaning himself as a miserable smith where Tilopa finds him. Then in order to gain instruction in the sameness of the one flavor of the six modes of cognition, Naropa suffers his guru's chastisement for living with a girl and beats his penis in anguish. Before Naropa can attain Mahamudra precepts, Tilopa demands a girl for himself and beats her for turning her back on him and smiling at Naropa. Bliss is to offer the mudra as a fee to the guru, said Naropa. You are worthy of bliss eternal, Naropa, replies his guru. Naropa's sadhana is his life with his guru. His twelve acts are real initiations, and success in practicing his precepts manifests only after six months. After only six months, Tilopa disappears finally after giving Naropa the most inclusive precept in Mahamudra. Do not imagine, think, deliberate, meditate, act, but be at rest. With an object, be not concerned. Thereafter, Naropa passes through a period of apparent insanity, playing, laughing, and weeping like a child, before settling down at uh, Pulahari and teaching for the rest of his life. Naropa's most important precepts were his six yogas. Precepts relating to the six fulfillment yoga practices included amongst the twelve given in his biography. They are associated with Vajra Varahi, who is his principal yidam. Samvara and He Vajra were, the, were his other mother tantra sadhanas. He also knew the Yuhi Samaja and Kala Chakra Tantras. His importance to Marpa the translator into the Tibetan tradition has exaggerated his status in the Indian tradition. After his ultimate attainment and his guru's death, Naropa initiated his consort, Niguma, who became his awareness Dakini. She translated many texts with Marpa, but is remembered primarily for her six fulfillment stage meditation techniques, similar to but different from Lakshminakara's uh, Pagmo Hundru. When she appeared to Kyungpo Naldorpa at Gana Chakra Rites in Tibet, she manifested her various aspects, dancing, the skin dark, ornaments made of bone, holding in her hands a kavanga and kapala, a frightening apparition of a dakini eater of human flesh. Historiography Naropa is associated with Kashmir, where several reputable sources say he was born, with Pulahari, or Pushpahari, his retreat hut, quite close to Nalanda, where he taught Marpa, with Vikramashila, where he undoubtedly was the northern gatekeeper, contemporary with Shantipa. Perhaps he was also associated with Nalanda, where he may have been an abbot, and with Ratnagiri Monastery near uh, Bhuvaneshwara in Odisha. Naropa is a great example among the Siddhas of a one guru Siddha. Although he may have had many straight teachers in Kashmir, Vikramashila and Nalanda, his disciples are many. Marpa the translator is certainly the most significant, as the essence of Naropa's sadhana was transmitted through him to Milarepa, Kampopa, and a host of great Tibetan yogins. It is said that he consecrated Atisha as abbot of Vikramashila. He taught the Sambara Tantra to Shantipa, the Nepali uh, Pantimpa, and Vakishwara Kirti, the Kashmiri Bodhibhadra, and to Maitripa, Dharmamati, Manakashri and Krishnacharya. He taught Chitra, Ch he taught uh, Chitarpa and Paindapatika from Nepal, a Mahasiddha Dhambipa, Kusalipa, and the Kashmiri Janakara, Marpa Dopa, and other Tibetans also received instructions from him. His tantric commentary concerns Hevadra and Kalachakra Tantras primarily. The root form of his name is Nada Pada, and the root of it Nada means roar. 
He is also known as Naro and Narotapa. Finally, Naropa's biography was written only 100 years after his death, and it gives the Siddha's dates as AD 1016 to 1100. Since such dates are much later uh, than has been previously conjected, Grunewald giving AD 924 to 1039, for instance, they have been disputed. It is certainly not difficult to believe that he lived through the middle decades of the century, but no evidence is offered in the biography other than the bare statement to that effect.